Hi all and welcome to Professor Trulove's Concepts for Nurses series and I am Professor Terry Trulove and in this episode part of the orthopedic concepts we will be reviewing osteoporosis and osteomalacia looking at assessments and interventions. Sources for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing, 9th edition. Both osteoporosis and osteomalacia refer to conditions in which there is essentially bone loss or the loss of bone structure. Osteoporosis is a problem found throughout the world and in countries where nutrition is an issue, you may have patients who have both osteoporosis and osteomalacia related to dietary insufficiencies. Let's review the different risk factors, signs and symptoms, and be able to differentiate between the two. Osteoporosis is a metabolic disease characterized by bone demineralization with the loss of calcium and phosphorus salts leading to fragile bones and the risk for fractures. This happens because bone reabsorption accelerates at the same time that bone formation slows. And it is most common in women from the ages of 55 to 65. It occurs most commonly in the wrist, the hip, and the vertebral column. Further, it occurs mostly after menopause, usually as a result of a metabolic disorder, calcium deficiency, or after menopause because of a lack of estrogen. It is asymptomatic until the bones become fragile, and a minor injury or movement causes a fracture. That pain causes the patient to go in and get a consult where we discover they have a fracture. Contributing factors include immobilization, steroids, a high intake of caffeine, a diet that is low in calcium and high in protein, smoking, and a sedentary lifestyle. You should know that generalized osteoporosis occurs most commonly in postmenopausal women in their 60s and 70s, although the incidence is higher between 50 and 60. It occurs in both men and women in a higher rate between 60 and 70. Secondary osteoporosis results from an associated medical condition, such as hyperthyroidism, long-term drug therapy, or long-term immobility. Regional osteoporosis occurs when a limb is immobilized, for instance, as if it is fractured, and, for, and the immobilization lasts for longer than eight weeks. As far as what to assess for, Patients who are complaining of backaches, who have a condition that porous or brittle bones, the presence of a dowager's hump, as in scoliosis, I'm sorry, that lordosis, pelvic or hip pain, especially with weight bearing, problems with balance, a decline in height from as a result of vertebral compression, and a degeneration of the lower thorax and lumbar vertebrae on x-ray. Diagnostic tests to determine the presence of osteoporosis include CBC, serum calcium levels, serum phosphorus levels, alkaline phosphate, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine levels, urinalysis, liver, and thyroid function tests. The provider is looking for calcium deficiencies or the presence of bone or bone products in the bloodstream. Medical management and nursing interventions includes pharmacological management such as calcium supplements and vitamin D, estrogen replacement therapy or aldontronate, weight-bearing exercise to promote uh, bone production, and dietary recommendations such as increase of intake of calcium and a decrease of protein in those who are taking too much protein. Bone mineral density testing. We look for something called a T-score. Osteopenia is present when the T-score is at negative 1 and above negative 2.5. However, osteoporosis is diagnosed when the T-score is at or lower than negative 2.5. Remember, we're measuring bone density. The lower the number, the less dense the bone is. Patient teaching about health promotion includes ensuring an adequate calcium intake, avoiding a sedentary lifestyle, but however, make sure that we modify the exercise so that it takes into effect that this needs low impact and continuing program of weight bearing exercises. Drug therapy includes, but is not limited to, things such as hormone replacement therapy, replacement of parathyroid hormone, calcium and vitamin D, biophosphates, selective estrogen receptor modulators, calcitonins. There are other agents used with varying results. For the most part, HRT, parathyroid, calcium, and vitamin D seem to be the 
treatment of choice for most of our patients. As far as diet therapy, make sure the patient is aware of their protein intake. Since calcium is primarily taken or transported by protein, protein is very important. However, you can't have too much protein. Other things to look for are magnesium and vitamin K, other trace minerals, calcium, vitamin C, and D supplements with iron, and avoiding alcohol and caffeine. Remember that the promotion of a single nutrient will not prevent or treat osteoporosis. It has to be an entire dietary lifestyle change. Osteoporosis is primarily diagnosed after a fall and the fracture resulting from that fall. So teach your patient about maintaining a hazard-free environment. Maintain a high-risk assessment through programs such as a Falling Star Protocol and offer hip protectors that prevent hip fractures in case the patient indeed does fall. So the other big bone density problem is known as osteomalacia, but this is a nutritional intake problem. Osteomalacia is the loss of bone related to a vitamin D deficiency caused by inadequate deposits of calcium and phosphorus to the bone matrix. It is the adult equivalent of rickets or vitamin D deficiency in children. And normal remodeling and calcification of the bone is disrupted because of the malnutrition. Besides the primary source of nutrition, there are secondary sources for osteomalacia. These include liver and pancreatic disorders, cro chronic kidney disease, and bone tumors. The major treatment for osteomalacia is vitamin D through dietary intake, exposure to the sun, and drug supplements such as ergocalciferol. Similar to osteoporosis, the person with osteomalacia has less than normal bone density. Therefore, safety precautions should be initiated to prevent falls. Make sure the patient is following protocols for medications. For instance, the use of increased fluids to prevent urinary cal uh, calculi with increased calcium intake or taking biphosphates with a large glass of water to prevent the common adverse effect of esophagitis. The most common type of surgery needed for both osteomalacia and osteoporosis is back surgery because of a vertebral compression fracture. So patient teaching should refer to the recovery of the surgery, including restoration of activity, reaching out for community resources such as physical therapy and occupational therapy, and maintaining adequate medication regimen. That is the end of this episode, but don't fear, there's more episodes to come. I hope you learned a little bit on this episode. I hope you plan on coming back and listening some more, and if you are, we'll see you then. Take care.